Welcome to episode 64 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Welcome to another Sunday. This is a pre recorded episode that was recorded on uh, March the 18th. Just got off with Robert C. Cooper. His schedule uh, is so is such that we don't uh, manage to have him on the weekends, but we uh, got to sit down with him for this week, and we discussed his, the remainder of the episodes from seasons one and two of SG One that we have not discussed before. So that's going to be the topic of conversation today. And I can already tell you that we're going to have him back next month to discuss creating Stargate Atlantis with Brad Wright in more depth. But before we get started here. If you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal to me if you click the like button. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm. It will definitely help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops. And you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. This is key if you plan on watching live. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days on the GateWorld.net YouTube channel. We only had Rob for about an hour, but it was an extremely good hour. So we're going to jump right into it. And uh, then I'll get to some notes after the show. So I appreciate you joining us. Let's bring him in. Robert C. Cooper, writer and executive producer, Stargate, SG-1, Atlantis and Universe. Thank you for joining me again, sir. It's always a pleasure a regular, to have you. Regular guest of, of David Reed and his podcast. I know. I I am very fortunate. We lost Cliff Simon a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, or I guess about 10 days ago at this point. Um, your thoughts on Cliff as an actor, as a human being, as Ball, if you don't mind? Um, Cliff was such a, a, a easygoing, charming guy. And it's always sort of, it's always funny when you see, you know, really nice people playing villains, uh, <laughs> which is the opposite of, uh, you know, not nice people playing good guys. Um, <laughs> the, it, you know, he's just, he was just a charming, wonderful guy to work with and uh, to have around. He was, he was good friends with uh, Michael Greenberg, which is how we first got to know him. And, um, you know, Michael pitched him uh, as Ball to come on the show. So, yeah, he used to drop by the writer's room and uh, our offices when he was when he was shooting. And, uh, you know, he he was he was very much what everybody's saying now, which is he was someone who who really, you know, enjoyed life and he was a, an adventurous spirit and, um, you know, it's a, it's always a tragic to lose somebody when they're still in in a, in the prime of their life, you know. Ball was one of those. Not to say that the uh, the the world villains didn't have didn't have arcs, but I mean, arguably the most complete arc w of the world was that character right there. We saw so many facets and aspects of his uh, personality and, you know, a, a gold who really understood humanity, if there ever was one, who really seemed like he was willing to make it work on on many, many levels at a certain point. I mean, I mean, you know, it's uh, in continuum well, because, because he he also, you know, what we did with him was made him, you know, one of the few golds who who went undercover essentially and hid on earth. So you could see him, you know, being uh, a human being or at least pretending to be a human being. And I feel like he, his character needed to uh, understand humans uh, more in order to imitate them. So uh, he had that dimension to him and just seeing him sort of without the, without the voice occasionally. And, the and uh, yeah. And, uh, that I think that just made his character, his Gould character, more interesting. On on so many levels, he was he was fascinated. He will be missed for sure. Fandom is just heartbroken over it, you know, and uh, it it goes to show what an impact he made on all of us, and you know how important uh, the work that you created is to to so many people. So, well, yeah, that's a that's a sort of sidelight to to uh, you know more important things. Really. Absolutely. I'd like you to take me back. We we had discussed a couple of your earlier episodes, First Commandment, Torment of Tantus. I'd like to proceed a little bit 
uh, further into season one, into your first year, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, I mean, season one is a a really long time ago. I know. <laughs> uh, and B, um, you know, the show is still forming, and yeah. I think you know, those episodes had reasons for being and kind of came about the way they, 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 you know, they, the way they came about. But I mean, I just, I don't know that they were maybe as successful as some of the later season shows uh, episodes, right? I mean, but happy to talk about them anyway. Yeah, you could, you could definitely make that argument, but I, I recently went, went back and watched a few of them and, you know, they, they are, charming on on many levels i think i think that that that's that's a, a fairly reasonable word for them and they are showing just how pretty well formed um the sg1 i mean you may disagree the the sg1 characters are um after uh just a handful of episodes you know when you look at a show like star trek the next generation it's really season two or three before those a lot of those characters are really starting to click. And with SG-1, I think it's fair to say that happened much more rapidly. I think the writers got the characters more quickly. I think the actors found the characters more quickly. Would you? Would you... Uh, okay. I mean, I, in all honesty, I have some regrets. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, and I think I think Brad and John would both agree and, and, and the other, you know, the other writers as well. But... I think the thing that made the show great and the thing that was there from the start was that, um, you know, that camaraderie and chemistry between the, the leads. And, and that's as much to do, you know, with, you know, to credit the actors that played those characters as much as our writing. Our writing kind of caught up to the, to the uh, performances. <laughs> that's fair. Well, you have to give it a little bit of time to get your to get your um, your feet wet, and one of those was yours with singularity. I love this episode. I think that um, it really was. It, it took Amanda Tapping from strength to strength, and it took Carter from strength to strength because we all we already knew. I mean, she had already logged so many hours, you know, in enemy airspace during the Persian Gulf. She had already proven herself as one of the people who had brought um, uh, uh, Stargate Command to where it was long before, you know, uh, the movie even took off. And it was so uh, cool to see, you know, to finally get an, uh, uh, an episode of her that didn't deal with, um, you know, a, an ex fiance or deal with her necessarily um, her her work skills. You know, we got to we got to see some chinks in her armor, as it were, with exploring um, a relationship with a with a child like Cassandra, and expanding on Fraser's role as well. You know, uh, you've Terrell's Terrell's great in that episode too. Tell us a mm -hmm. little bit about Singularity. So, first of all, that ex fiance is one of the regrets I have. Okay. Uh, but it was like episode three, man. Cut yourself yeah. some slack. No, no, I, I know. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's a good example. First of all, I, I generally have, and I think it's become increasingly uh, more so, I have a, an aversion to uh, children in jeopardy drama. And I, and I think, I just think it's kind of, unpleasant and cheap and and uh i'm i'm you know i put put myself a little bit in that category for having done that episode however uh i guess the thinking behind it and why it was a a bit of an exception was because one of the things we do and we've talked about this a lot is we can explore uh you know real life real world issues and 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 themes without you know in a, in a science fiction you know protective coding uh to some extent so uh you know there are there are ex many examples of um terrorist groups using uh children as, mm -hmm. as human shields or throughout history in in danger. and yeah and uh you know, it just felt like that was that was a, 
I guess a point worth making, but also a really difficult situation. Like when you, when you, I guess the way to get through to the core of who a character is, is to put them in a tough situation, a, a moral dilemma, a choice, you know, it's, it's, it's always about seeing them at their best and their worst. And, um, we had, you know, we, I felt like we needed that moment for Carter and there was actually quite a bit of debate in the room and in, you know, in conversations with, with the studio and the network about, about whether she would actually make that choice, like to go down that elevator. Like when you think about how valuable Carter is to the Stargate program and, and what she means i mean mm -hmm. if you were if you were a you know uh, an, an empirical ai just doing a, a a net benefit analysis of the situation you'd be like you know sorry kid and o'neill <laughs> makes that judgment call he says get your ass back up here this is not acceptable you know well yeah i mean but, i mean look there like fans would would say that was as that was a early indication of his personal feelings for her but i i do think yes in 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 you know neil's estimation he it was more that he had you know i think he had made the decision that it was likely a fait accompli anyways so why that's lose true. carter that's a different scenario than you know sending sending people to an almost certain death in order for there to be a small chance of survival. So, you know, the, the question was, was Carter literally sacrificing her life in order to comfort a child during her inevitable death? And, you know, I think deep down Carter didn't believe that was the case. She always felt like there would be one last solution or one thing that she could do. You know, in fact, you know, it wasn't entirely true. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, that was the debate behind it. And, and, and I guess that's what I, what I love uh, about sci-fi storytelling is, is put it, being able to put characters in those extreme situations. Um, in which we we test their moral compass and and what they would do in any in those types of extreme situations. So, I, I you know also I have a, a vague memory uh, of, of, um, of sorry it's actually quite a vivid memory uh, <laughs> of it's not vague at all uh, the director Mario as a party yeah. um, who is a very uh, animated and um, colorful guy and uh, was in Brad's office. We were standing in Brad's office and he was pitching us how he wanted her to deal with this elevator scene. And he, he was like demonstrating how upset he wanted Carter to get. And he threw himself against Brad's wall. And, and I, this is the vague part. I think he cracked the wall. I can't be certain. The walls in our office looked nice, but they were very flimsy. And uh, <laughs> everybody was like, what the hell's going on? And people came running. And that's just that's just Mario. Um, thankfully, Amanda chose to do something slightly more subdued uh, than that. But but the the spirit was, you know, was right in that we had not seen Carter go to that emotional place. Before. Correct. So I think it was a, a an opportunity to reveal a, an, an aspect of her humanity that we hadn't seen before. And, and, you know, it's always nice to be able to single a character out that way. And it continued to play out, you know, in a couple more episodes throughout uh, the series. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a great, it's a great story. The, the, the uh, the Earthbound episodes that grew out of that. I mean, you you bring her back in in the line of duty, which I'd like to talk about in a couple of minutes. But later on, you know, rite of passage as well. There are lasting repercussions um, to what 
uh, the team does out in the universe that that come close to home. One of them is, you know, it. One of them is Cassandra. So, so yeah. it's a it's a great. Uh, <laughs> she turns out as a teenager turns out to be a great foil for for Carter. So there you go, and for Fraser. Uh, there but for the grace of God is the first episode that Stargate goes into multiple reality territory if if I'm getting my facts straight. And I think that that's right. Um, it came from, I believe, a story by David Kemper. And, and you wrote uh, the teleplay. Right. Was there talk earlier on about uh, the possibility of going into multiple reality territory with this show was it was it david's idea was it a combination of of a bunch of people's you know where did that come from uh yeah like i remember there being quite a bit of confusion uh from people not not on the show but outside the show you know studios networks people marketing people um about what the Stargate actually did. <laughs> and so it's very important to always uh, have rules and have those rules, right. you know, clearly defined initially and then sort of stick to them. So we, we were like, no, it's not a time travel device and no, it doesn't go to other realities and no, it's not going into the universe. It's a, it's a device that takes you from one planet to another. And the, the time travel thing was very confusing for people because we were going to planets that looked like old Earth. So we looked festivals. like we were going. We looked like we were going back in time. Right. Um, so, you know, Brad and Jonathan did a a lot of work to try and make that clear and 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 establish those rules. So. Uh, when when the alternate reality story came up, it was like, oh, we can't we can't suddenly now say there's an alternate reality function on the gate, you know. Uh, it was a way of sort of exploring uh, and anticipating a worst case scenario, right? Mm. It's like that worst case scenario handbook of what do we do when and if this happens. It was a way of visualizing that and having fun with it um because the gold had never attacked earth directly yet no so and, their, and their level of of intensity and power was still an unknown as a collective as a group well and and brad and jonathan knew that they wanted Poffis to show up at the end of season one and so this was a, a fun way of anticipating the consequences of that so that that reveal would have impact you know like oh my god this is what we're facing. Um, and, you know, and, and it was also just another way of uh, putting a character in a, a fun situation. The, 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 you know, it's created a, in, in myself and in my own work, uh, almost a bias against alternate reality stories because I learned some lessons in the making of that one and subsequent other ones, which is that it's very hard. It, A, you don't want the alternate, the fact that alternate realities exist to undermine the importance of your main reality. And I think sometimes when you have so many realities and timelines going on, it can just sort of take away from the story and the characters that you're following. Mm. And and we had a lot of notes on that episode. In fact, there were people who didn't really want us to do it because the argument was who cares about what happens in this other reality? And I was like, well, we care about Daniel and what happens to him. Correct. But where's the tension? Because this is not our people. There was fun in seeing, you know, Carter and, and uh, O'Neill um, doing things they wouldn't normally do. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, we had a lot of arguments with uh, the, um, the Air Force, too, at the time, uh, who didn't want them to, to kiss, uh, for one, because they were like, well, uh, 
to you know an officer would never do that Support to another us. officer yeah. so we're like well it's an alternate reality so we'll just make her not an officer how's that there you go <laughs> and they really didn't have a they really didn't have a uh you know a choice at that point they didn't have an argument there <laughs> um but that's the problem with alternate reality is that it's 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 not you it's when people are getting shot it's not it's not the characters you know and love it's sort of a, a version a pale version of them and so and and when you do it too much or when you create too many multiples and intersect them too much you lose you really lose the the sort of emphasis and and um and the weight of your reality it and i think it's it's interesting because you know in oh, sorry of, just to finish i didn't mean oh, to interrupt you there but please. just to finish that thought is that what came out of all of that and what wasn't there initially the biggest sticking point from the writing of the script was what does daniel bring back in other words what is the point of this mission so he has to go and learn something that he can then bring to our reality that has an impact there. So because that threat was on its way, you know, what can he, what can he do that he's learned in the, in the alternate reality that will help us in ours? That, that was the only way we could sort of sell the episode. The as the address and the message that they're coming. It's I, I get goosebumps even thinking about that. That's a good show, and it's a dark show, and it's interesting because uh, when when we return to that aspect of of the series and point of view, you give Teal the line, "Ours is the only reality of consequence," right? Which, which was which was completely born out of all those arguments that that we had at the time, and and it's of course the to your to yourself, <laughs> you know, you don't know what your other other selves are doing in other realities. That's fair. Um, but he treats them almost uh, like shadows, like they're not people, which right. is an interesting perspective. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. That is, you know, basically part one of a four part uh, story. It, it really is within politics and then within the serpent's grasp and, and serpent's lair. And I, you know, Brad and I once talked about uh, the fact that uh, SG-1 was really a hybrid show. You had standalone episodes, but you also could still do serialized stories and trusted the audience to watch them sequentially. And, you know, more or less wanted to make sure that the, uh, if wherever possible, the, the, the syndicators would, would air them in the right order, you know, because there's yeah, no reason I mean other than to do that. It, get, it got more and more serialized as the show went on. And, 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 uh, and I think it's a bit of a, I mean, we still had closed ended. It wasn't a complete cliffhanger at the end of, of the episode. So we, we would have a, a complete story, but still this, the story lines of the episodes became much more mythology based as, as the show went on. I think that the complete, um, you know, standalone monster of the week didn't really happen much after season four or five. Ronnie Cox. I, yeah. I meant uh, to ask you about him in the original notes uh, that I sent you as uh, Senator, Senator Kinsey, when he comes in with that speech in politics and he rattles everyone up, did you realize what, what an awesome character uh, you and your team had uh in in the works there for for future well, we, stories we knew that that first of all i mean politics is a clip show let's call it what let's call it what it is it is and and you know these were done as money saving uh uh endeavors um it's a way but you know look if we if we approach it right if we um you know build the original part of the clip show properly um it has it ultimately ends up having a point and 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 fans will understand that you know in this case which it ends up being a bit of a trial i mean the, the program is put on trial to some extent mm -hmm. and and the footage we're showing is essentially the the case the evidence that's being presented so so that uh, I think that worked, I, but you know, you're hanging so much of, uh, 
the weight of the show, the narrative of the show on one character, he, he better he better be, you know, a good actor. <laughs> <laughs> you better have some TVQ, as they say. Um, hey, Ronnie is fantastic. You know, he 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 felt like he he was the guy and he carried, you know, look, he he was in the show for a long time after that because he was so great. And and, you know, that is the you can easily go through <laughs> I shouldn't say this really, but you can go through the, you know, the cast list. And when you see a when you see a character come back repeatedly like that, you, you can pretty much assume he's a good guy. Right. Because because we just life's too short and and we love having him and uh you know we would have invented another senator or something if we had if we didn't like him so that's a great uh way of telling how much we loved him absolutely and he was a great foil for o'neill you know um rick it's not fair to say that he didn't like to act because he he certainly he certainly um you you i don't think you could have done that show without him in many respects but there are certain characters and certain scripts that when you placed him into a corner he would fight his way out of it as an actor and just yeah. just absolutely make a meal of that script and i think there's a couple of scenes in politics where he really does that yeah i mean one of my favorite performances of his was paradise lost i mean i think that was one where he kind of <laughs> did that um there were others i mean he you know uh, the first i think we've talked before that, that like the first real spark uh, i saw from him off screen in which he got really excited about a script was um uh fifth race you know he just right. just loved talking to thor um, <laughs> but but yeah i mean you know look he he had a he 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 had a comfort zone and part of that came from you know, all of the experience he had building his brand of who he was. Absolutely. And, um, and uh, but yeah, no, he was he was capable of all kinds of, of um, you know, incredible range. Season two, you're going into season two. Um, at that point, I think you guys knew that there were there were five seasons. I think the fifth season had been greenlit before the end of season one. Am I correct? I think it was four. Okay, it's still a four at this point. Four All right. Point. So you know that you guys are going to be around for a while. You're beginning to to really sink your teeth into the mythology of the show. And you've got some time to, um, you know, let let a notch or two loose on the belt, as it were, and, and explore some other some other facets. And you guys introduced the idea of the Tok'ra against Ra, literally. Uh, uh, how early were they in the development uh, phase? Were they... In, anywhere in season one where it was thinking that, you know, well, we're going to have to have, you know, that we're going to need to do more with the goal. Well, let's, let's, let's create literally like an anti goal, you know, a, a group of them who are physiologically and, and the same species, but go off in a completely different, different direction and use that as a story element to scare the audience into thinking that what happened to Kowalski is going to now happen to Carter. Yeah, um, the the thing, and I I think we've talked about this before too. So forgive me for repeating myself, but it's it's a recurring theme that in science fiction, one of the pitfalls and problems you have is is you create you know people with superpowers. Essentially, you create villains that are super powerful, and I'm just talking about flying around like a superhero. I'm talking about like superhuman power uh superhuman technology um and and so you have you have problems where either it's too powerful and you have to find a way to undermine that power mm. uh we talked about the fact that the replicators were mm -hmm. in a way an invention that helped explain you know why thor wasn't just coming and destroying the gould um he was busy he was busy he was doing he was he had doing his own things, things fight you know to to fight um so the you know by having uh, apophis come at the end of season one and essentially we win it's like what what how do you not avoid the you know the just going the end you know and 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 it's all over you know so you have to 
you have to create complexity and complication for the for the uh, uh, bad guys too, right? Like as much as you're developing your good guys, you then have to add layers to um, to the bad guys. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that was really what came out of that was like, where are we going with the ghouls and who they are? They've already attacked earth and failed. You know, obviously what's stopping them necessarily from coming again or different ones coming again and, and winning next time. So, you know, eventually that would happen, but uh, we had to A, delay it and B, uh, we had to build their uh, world out more. And so the Tokra were, were um, you know, the answer to how to add complexity to the Gould world. And then also get, give us a way into that, a personal way in from our own character's point of view. So with, with yeah, with uh, Jolinar taking her over. Yeah. You no, know, gave Amanda a bunch to play with. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was just a great twist to, to, to see Carter's eyes glow. <laughs> Absolutely it was. You know, and we think that that's happened. A lot of, I mean, a lot of us who are really following the shore are like, well, that's it. You know, <laughs> I mean, we tried to remove, I mean, of course, we'll, we'll, she'll more than likely survive, but how are they going to pull that out? We tried to remove one and he killed the guy as soon as you tried to do it. So, yeah. I mean, what happens next there? And it was a great use of, of Cassandra as well, because she's your little ghoul detector. You know, right. she can let everyone know. And she's also one of the people who encourages, you know, Sam near the end there. You're going to be all right. You know, it's, that's a great show. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was, uh, yeah, I remember that one went through quite a few um, revisions as well, just because it, it, it was again, we were rewriting or writing the mythology, mm. you know, as we went. So you were pretty cognizant of, okay, whatever we do here is going to be recorded as the way that it's done. So we need to, you know, be careful well, we were, of where yeah, we, we lay we, down we, the we, tracks. Yeah, we were teeing up a whole storyline that we knew was going to hopefully, you know, have legs, give us a story going forward. Talk about some amazing episodes this, this season for these actors need uh goes into a possible explanation for why the Gwawuld are as bad as they are with the sarcophagus and you you use Daniel and Michael's performance to tell a straight up story about um addiction and addiction yeah, to power no. just say no right just say no to just drugs. say no <laughs> I don't think he even had the first choice. I think that he, I think. No, he, he got put there. into it. He got, yeah. he got, he got addicted. He got roofied. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, it's like I said, it, it's two things. It's, it's that ability to tell a story about uh, an interesting thing that's happening in the world around you in reality. Mm. Um, and and again, trying to solve a problem, a logic hole, essentially, which is, you know, if the sarcophagus is so great, why aren't we just using it all the time? Anytime someone gets hurt, just pop them in the sarcophagus. Um, it's it's like you invent something. In fact, in that case, that's from uh, the movie. It's from the movie. And, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't have the, the long-term, uh, you know, it's like the problem in Superman, right? is if Superman can just fly around the planet real fast, uh, backwards, undo everything that bad that happens, he's got an instant do-over every single time. And yet, you know, they just frankly ignored that going forward. Because, <laughs> yeah, we uh, use that one time. He gets he gets one yeah, life to do it. One time. Like, and that's it. But that's the problem is you you have these 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 high powered advanced technology or people with superpowers and you have to try and figure out why they aren't participating in the narrative mm -hmm. the way they logically should. Um, and so that just gave birth to the idea that, oh wait, maybe there's a negative side effect. I mean, it's in, in, as someone who has taken some, you know, medication 
in the past, yeah. uh, it, it's never without side effects. And so that just sort of a natural progression of the idea that came to me, which was maybe this helps explain some of the world. If you have good Goulds essentially with Tokra, um, and and you have this this device. Uh, wouldn't it be great if there was you know some connection between all that, and then put your character through uh, through the gauntlet? So, you know, it was uh, that was again, and, and you know, it just Michael is a phenomenal actor, and and uh, he would just eat up any any opportunity we gave him to kind of push the envelope and go as far as he could. He was terrific and unspeakable. I'd just like to tell you. Yeah, he was. To and I mean, that unspeakable was a, a totally different thing for him too, yes. because he was very restrained. I mean, Michael is an incredibly passionate guy. And when I first went to him to talk to him about that, I knew he would be, um, you know, he would be in because he's such a uh, sort of social justice warrior, you know, and, and he gets very passionate about it. And we talked a lot about it and he had to find ways of, you know, making the character compelling without, you know, always going to 11, you know? And then, so there's these scenes where he does get very upset and very angry and they just, you know, they well, just pop He's a dad, off. you know? He, yeah. He's got this little boy that's going through, who I, I imagined was you watching this. Um, yeah. I really thought that that particular that particular child was you for right or for wrong. Um, yeah, and it was very close. I mean, fic fictional, fictional. Well, yes, yeah, so a fictional. Yes, yeah. um, and he's he's got to get people's cooperation. So yeah. he's got to be uh, there a certain level of diplomacy while recognizing the fact that his kid may very well die from this. So yeah. he can't just go in guns a blazing. And you can see well, the that, wheels turning would... while he's dealing with this problem. Look, I, I mean, that's. I felt uh, like that was one of my learning curves in life and maybe I'm still learning it. And, uh, and, in, and in fact, the real guy who that character was based on um, had the same problem where he would uh, maybe not handle the situation quite as diplomatically as it, it, it called for. But on the other hand, the people he was dealing with were such Mm -hmm. I put this, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, jerks that it's hard to believe he did keep his cool as much as he did, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, you just, I just don't think you ever really get anywhere from losing your temper. Um, so we kind of kept it that he lose, he would lose his temper only after it seemed like, mm there was no uh, no point in holding it back. <laughs> For those uh, who have not seen Unspeakable, it is available uh, on Amazon Prime. I know in North America, I'm not sure if it is in Europe or some of these it other is. countries. It's okay. available in, it's in, in England for sure. Okay. Um, and uh, it's also in the US on Sundance Now if you happen to Perfect. get that. Perfect, yes. This is, uh, this is not a happy miniseries. You know, you're not going to go in in most of it feeling warm and fuzzy, but I think it's a very important one, and it's it's there Rob is, and there Michael is, look, and I mean, many characters to defend at their best. that. I mean, yes, I agree. It's it's there are there are some bad things that happen, but I do believe it it does it does um, it does showcase the <clears throat> the power of the human spirit and and uh, and how tragedy can bring out the best in people mm -hmm. and the worst but but it, there are definitely heroes in the story and they are inspiring in the same way that we have seen heroes arise in our current uh pandemic tragedy that we're that we're all living through so very similar case there's a couple of scenes especially at the supermarket that are very that really echo that yeah yeah, well, and and I mean, look, in Canada, the DNA of some of the deficiencies we're experiencing now can be, and frankly, some of the advantages that we're experiencing are all uh, born out of that, that um, you know, that scandal. Mm. Understood. Bane. I wanted to get to the fifth race, so I've got one more to go. And okay. so we have, we have Bane, which Christopher Judge... To this day, it was like, it was the bane of my existence. It was such a good story, but I couldn't go pee. 
<laughs> Turning him yeah. into a yeah, I mean, look, that, larva that was, that was, of flies. Yeah, I mean, look, it was it was a that was an homage, I guess, is the best way of putting it to the fly. I mean, it was, right. it's a it's a transformation show. That's that's a, a fairly common sci-fi trope, uh, and um, and we've done that. Uh, we did that multiple times, multiple ways. Other shows have done it that way. Mm -hmm. um, was that the nugget I, of the idea, transformation? Because I look at this and it's like sometimes, you know, you have to rely on help from unexpected places. You know, I think that's what I take away from it. Yeah, I, I think that, well, I think that's, uh, um, you know, I think, I think I wanted to do a more, uh, you know, having come off of the child in jeopardy story, I wanted to show a child being more proactive and, and uh, you know, not in danger, but helping, you know, being a, a, a positive aspect of the story. And, and also I think that pairing children with your lead actors is just a different way of revealing who they are. You know, um, Jack was, totally different. I mean, you know, A, you have his character history of his, his son dying. Um, but you also, uh, you just see how he treats adults versus how he treats children. And it shows right. you a different side of him. Um, so Teal'c was such a, a stoic, you know, and frankly, you know, physical and somewhat scary character from the beginning, showing him with a child just gave us a chance to reveal a different side of him that was i think great um and when it comes to earth fun. he is innocent in many respects like a child too. oh yeah yeah he has that aspect and so seeing them play off each other in that way was also a lot of fun um again just trying to find ways to uh put your characters in these extreme situations that give them a a chance to show who they are. And Teal's sort of uh, his sacrifice of himself, even down to him, you know, taking the symbiote out, mm -hmm. um, demonstrated just how trustworthy he was. You know, that was always a thing for, for him. Um, you know, did, did, did the people of Earth trust him? Mm -hmm. uh, and he was very grateful for them taking him in. So, you know, the fact that he was didn't want to become uh, something that was going to hurt anyone, uh, I thought just really also revealed great things about who he was. You get this idea in watching Tilk um, right at the end of, of the pilot that this going to Earth is his last stand. Like what? Whatever comes after this, that's it. He he tried his best, and and he's willing to lay it all down. We see that in Korai. It's like, well, with Teal, it's very much you see this. My numbers up quality coming from him throughout uh, in those earlier seasons. You know, because he is he is weighed down by the awful things that he did. And it, it's another great, great example of acting by Christopher Judge and, and, and Richard Dean Anderson in, in Cori, you know, that they just they fight over, you know, where where do you quit uh, over the point at which you quit fighting and give in to your fate to allow someone some semblance of um, of uh, uh, closure. But with Bane. Uh, you get an episode where, you know, he's now now we have this element that shows that he can't trust every member of Earth because we're beginning to introduce the Rogan ID in season two. The Earthbound stories are starting to to percolate and begin to boil, as it were. And we've got Tom Macbeth doing a wonderful job with Mayborn in that aspect of the society, going after Teal and looking at him more as more as um a, a military asset rather than as a being. What, what I, I mean, yeah, that's hundred percent true. I, I, what I find interesting about the Teal character, even looking back at it now through the lens of 
today is, you know, what you were just saying, look, you find one inappropriate tweet in someone's past and they get the electric chair canceled out of existence. And, you know, Teal was not dissimilar to a Nazi soldier. He was a murderer who was doing things that his, you know, leaders told him to, or he was going to die probably as a result. And, you know, he, this is a story about rehabilitation and redemption and, and the value that someone can bring after change. So the fact that we can't look at someone who, and understand the context of why they were doing the bad thing they were doing and then understand what it takes to bring them around to, un- to doing the right thing and being a better person and seeing the value they can bring mm-hmm. as a result. So, I mean, it's just, we've gotten to the point where we can't even, we can't even begin to understand that type of nuance or we do it and it's just so incredibly selective, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, we choose to ignore information. Yeah, and I mean, well, look, I mean, we all, look, the, 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 as the world, as a country, as a politics, as people, we have all done bad things in our past, some farther back and some more recent, but, and to varying degrees of badness. But, uh, you know, you've got to look at context and intent and, and, uh, and then, and then what is the, you know, what is that person country, whatever, doing, moving forward, you mm-hmm. know? It's interesting. Yeah, I have I have friends who are very much like, we, we argue over, like, tweets and what, what people have done, you know, uh, on on social media and in their lives and how, you know, there's no forgiveness for them. But then we're, we're okay with, with talking about the, the, um, the ultimate virtue of Darth Vader. And it's like, y- you find that interesting, don't you? What? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, he was... Just, uh, yeah, this was a murder, untold millions, but yet he can get redemption because we know his story. <laughs> well, and and again, I think there's a separation in science fiction That's from true. reality, right? Um, I think a, you know, someone who was responsible for genocide in our world would not ever get a second chance. Yeah. But you, you go there's a sliding scale that, that works its way down between a, a, a misguided tweet and genocide. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and yet we seem to have lost perspective That's on what that, context, what that scale is. Yeah. I'd love to end this on um, one of the most amazing episodes that ever came out of of science fiction, as far as I'm concerned. And I know I'm blowing smoke up your butt, but you know what? It's it's well-deserved in this point because the fifth race is a tour de force for that cast. Um, and it exemplifies, I, I in summary, I think, I, I think we're going to be all right. You know, what O'Neill says in, in the end of that. And I often think of that, that quote, and him standing on that ramp saying that in some of the I have often thought of that in some of the darker days of this this past year and change. We're going to be all right. What was the impetus for Fifth Race? You laid the bones down with with uh, Torment of Tantalus that there was there was a there was a, a, a group of races that that uh, preceded us that were not the were not the the first to start going through this gate. Um where, where did the the idea of the fifth race first come from? What was it that sparked it in you? Was it was it O'Neill babbling an alien language? What what was the impetus of that story? Yeah, I mean, I I'm I have a recurring fascination with stories about people losing their minds or losing their identities and and sort of the process of which you whether it happens quickly or slowly, whether you're aware of it and what you think about that. I mean, it's just a, it's another way of looking at mortality, which mm. is something I, I get a lot of uh, mileage out of. And I, so I, I just, I love the idea of putting O'Neill in that, in that situation. And then, and then tying it into 
uh, yeah, the, the four races from, from, from Tormund of Tantalus. I mean, it, it just, that was just way too much of a, a sort of loose thread not to, not to go back to. Um, and the, again, I mean, I feel like anytime we can, Thor was always a kind of up there in his spaceship. God. Yeah, he's basically he, God. He, he even quite literally was a, a hologram illusion. Like he was, he was a, he was a facade. And so, you know, he was the wizard. Uh, and so I just wanted to get to know him and the Asgard better. I wanted to know what was going on with them and how they could fit into the mythology going forward. So, um, I, you know, and, and it really, honestly, the, 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 the impetus was from a personal perspective is uh, I didn't have a great relationship with, with Rick before that. Like it wasn't that we didn't get along or whatever. He just saw me as a, a sort of more junior writer and I was moving up in the, in the sort of hierarchy of the show. And I had my designs on, on, you know, wanting with everyone's blessing on wanting to be, you know, a showrunner. And so I felt uh, I needed to, I need to overcome that. I need to connect with him. And, and, uh, and so I, I, you know, I decided I need to write a, an O'Neill centric show and, uh, you know, engage with him, uh, you know, in conversation about, you know, what the character was going to do and how it was going to go and essentially take his notes. He used to, he frankly used to send his notes through Michael Greenberg. And I rarely had a chance to sort of engage with him about that. So with this script, when it first came out, I, I went down and sat down in his trailer with him and talked to him through and you know that's when i first realized i thought frankly my anticipation of going into that meeting was that he was going to hate acting with the puppet <laughs> uh, and uh because he'd think it was silly and then yeah. you know uh it turned out he absolutely loved it and um so you know he rick was nothing if not unpredictable <laughs> <laughs> and it gave birth to all host of Asgard stories with them, you know. They like me. <laughs> so it was um uh yeah, it was a lot of fun that episode. So it gave it gave us a an opportunity to kind of like you said, um say some of those those big things, right? Did you think that it would get as much traction as it has gotten over the years? With people no. regularly calling out in the top five, top ten. No. Did you get that feel when you were in the editing phase of this episode that you had a real gem? Not really. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, uh, there are episodes where I, where in the making of it, I thought, "Oh, this is pretty good," and and I think the fans are going to like this one. But I had no. I was. It was too early at that point still for me to uh, get a sense of what the scope of the fandom was mm. going to be like for the show, never mind for any one episode. Well, from a mythology standpoint, uh, uh, once uh, Gerwin gets returned from the uh, from the Bliskner uh, at the end of Thor's Chariot, she says, you know, like us, you're still far too young. So, well, we'll never see the Asgard again. And then we give them a reason because we show them just how smart we are. <laughs> with O'Neill, it's like maybe these are maybe these are creatures worth paying attention to. Yeah, yeah, and it was like I was also playing with the idea that O'Neill, and particularly Rick's interpretation of O'Neill, was that he was kind of playing dumb guy, and <laughs> you know, and it just it just seemed f funny to me that he turned out to be the the smart guy that impressed the godlike alien. That's exactly right. <laughs> Absolutely. Robert fantastic as always. I would love to uh 
to have you back to talk a little bit more about Atlantis and 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 creating uh, sure. that show from the ground up with with Brad getting ready to I mean exploring yeah, I mean, that its own facet. Was, uh, you know, like you had written in your questions and notes, that was quite a that was probably the most one of the most challenging directing uh, situations I went through. Satita. Yeah. Oh, but it was worth it. Yeah, it was just a huge show logistically and um uh yeah it was a lot of fun my thanks once again to robert c cooper for joining us for this episode of dial the gate we've partnered with 3d tech pro for the month of march to give you a chance to get your very own atlantis puddle jumper and bc303 to enter to win these items you need to use a desktop or laptop computer and visit dialthegate.com scroll down to submit trivia questions your trivia may be used in a future episode of Dial the Gate, either for our monthly trivia night or for a special guest to ask me in a round of trivia. Please note the submission form does not currently work for mobile devices. Your trivia must be received before April the 1st. If you're the lucky winner, I'll be notifying you via your email to get your address. Please be sure to check out our partner's website for more Stargate-related merchandise at 3dtech.pro. And Dial the Gate is brought to you every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching, but if you want to support the channel, the channel further, buy yourself some of our themed swag. We're now offering t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages in a variety of sizes and colors at Redbubble, and we currently offer four themed designs and hope to add more in the future. The word cloud designs have both a solid background or transparent background option, so you have some flexibility between choosing a light or dark color. Do keep that in mind when you're making your selection. Checkout is fast and easy, and you can even use your Amazon or PayPal account. Just visit dialthegate.redbubble.com, and thank you as always, for your support. Next week at 12 noon Pacific time, March the 28th, Joseph Malazzi is going to be joining us to discuss season eight of Stargate SG-1. If you really like the show, please like, share, subscribe it. It helps out with YouTube's algorithms and, and getting us a promotion. We're soon to hit 10,000 uh, subscribers. All thanks to you guys. Thank you so, so very much for that. And thanks to my moderating team, Summer, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy, Reese, Anthony. You guys are the best. Big thanks to Jennifer Kirby and Linda, the Gate Gabber Fury. Show wouldn't be possible without all of you guys. My thanks once again to Robert C. Cooper and to you for joining us this weekend. My name is David Reed. We'll see you on the other side.